So welcome back to the last day of uh, the workshop. And I hope yesterday was a, a nice dinner for every, oh, everybody that went. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to introduce Alexei Kluhman from the University of Bristol. He'll be talking about uh, partition regularity of squares. Right. Yep. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, fantastic to be back to Rio again. Um, and that's, that's been an absolutely spectacular conference. So thanks very much. And banquet, as we can see, yeah, went well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is this um, a topic in something that I'm not a specialist and started working about a year and a half ago, uh, which is called arithmetic Ramsey theory. And arithmetic Ramsey theory is the um, sort of questions, the prototypical example of the first question in arithmetic Ramsey theory is a famous result of Schur, which goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. And the general framework is the following. So suppose I color natural numbers into k colors. So I partition it into k colors. Then the claim is that there exists a color. So if n is partitioned into k colors, then there is a color ci. And there are three numbers, x, y, and z, such that they add up to each other. So I will call, if such things happen, that no matter how you partition the integers into k, k cells, you get a solution to the equation. I will call such equations partition regular. And well, this is an example of a linear equation, which is partition regular. So linear case, of course, there are linear and nonlinear equations. So linear case, by about mid of 20th century, um, Rado, well, essentially dealt with all the linear equations and all systems of linear equations. So he completely classified when the linear equations are partition regular in system of linear equations. So all linear equations he classified. And of course, like in general, uh, there is many, many, many questions about the partition regularity. There is one der Waarden famous theorem, which tells you that no matter how you color integers, you can find infinite arithmetic uh, arbitrary long arithmetic progression of one color. And there is, well, Samaradis theorem, which is about the density version of these questions. But the linear equations are understood, essentially. So what I want to talk about today is a nonlinear case. Um, and, uh, well, let me tell you a bit of history, at least the way I see it. I'm not sure this is the right perspective, but the first result in this area is the famous theorem of, well, the simplest nonlinear equation that has been considered is a famous theorem of Fustenberg and Sarkozy. I won't write fully the names right now because uh, uh, there is quite a few of them. So Fustenberg and Sarkozy prove that if I partition integers in k colors, then I can always find the color and two numbers, x and y. And the third, which belong, by the way, I should say here that x, y, z belong to c, i. And I can always find the color and an integer n, maybe of different color, such that the difference is a square. So I'm not requiring this to be of the same color, but no matter how I partition it, so this is partition regular with respect to x and y. So this is the end of 70s, beginning of so 80s. And uh, very quickly after that, Vitaly Bergelson, uh, actually gave an argument how to make all three numbers to be of the same color. So even this equation 
is partition regular. OK, this is quite a simple equation. So what else can I consider? Um, so there is another. Well, of course, I can put here plus, for instance, and ask what happens with this equation. It's another simple linear equation. X and Y are of the same color. And N can be anything. Is this partition regular? And so it was a, it was a quite a well-known question of Sam Erdős. And uh, it, it's about, so these are 80s, um, or 70s, 80s, and this is a uh, result already in 2000. So Kafalak and Samaradi, Andrew Samaradi, they proved that this equation is partition regular. So no matter how I divide into k colors, always can find the sum such that it adds up to s squared. <clears throat> Wonderful. So what can I do with this equation more? Uh, let's put here, well, can we find, is this partition regular? Can we find all three of them to be of the same color? Here is an uh, interesting story. So, I mean, not story, but uh, so Tsvitkari, Gayamati, Sharkozy, again in 2000, they show is, that this is, is not partition regular. And so they exhibit the color. I think or, original was about 16 colors, uh, such that uh, if you break them in 16 colors, can't find three which satisfy this equation. Uh, OK, uh, now. What about, so the, the, what about maybe less colors? And so ben, uh, Sophia Lindquist and Ben Green, and then a bit, uh, so using uh, additive combinatorial technique and Peter Park using purely combinatorial technique, they actually showed that this equation is partition regular for two colors. So if I color into two colors, I can always find a solution to this equation. And they exhibit, I think, for three colors already, they exhibit the example when it's not partition regular. So this problem is completely understood in this way. Let me write another equation. I, I can keep going that way. But uh, of course, the other way of making it more nonlinear than it looks is to put one of them square. So this equation. Uh -huh. So what about this equation? That's another step. And this equation is a, uh, so it has been a very long time uh, that uh, people didn't know what to do with that until it, 2016. So breakthrough of Joel Moreira, who is, uh, well, by the way, everything I'm talking about is the joint work with Nikos Fredzikinakis and Joel Moreira. Uh, so Moreira in 2016 showed that this, this is, is partition regular. And you would, it's, it is a consequence of his result, which is very, very nice, that um, if you color integers in K colors, you can always find numbers X and Y, such that X times Y, X plus Y, and X are of the same color. The conjecture is that you can even make y to be of the same color as everything else, but it is still open. It's a famous Heidman conjecture. Okay? And this is consequence of that, where he proved that. Okay, finally I'm approaching something I want to take. So there is no other way I can keep writing these equations, random equations, but uh, you can see the flavor. The other uh, next is this equation. I guess another step of nonlinearity. And this equation, which is called, well, this is called Pythagoras' equation, obviously. Uh, but it, of course, has a very nice uh, interpretation. Like, um, so what I, I color integers in k colors, and I want to find triangle with x, y, z, such that all sides right of angle triangle are colored of the same way. OK? So what about this? What do we know about this equation? Well, this is, some people call it the holy grail of arithmetic Ramsey theory. 
because uh, we know nothing. I mean, we do know something, but uh, so here is, this is a very famous conjecture of Erdős and Graham, Graham and Erdős, uh, so that this equation is partition regular. So the only thing, so this is the conjecture, but the only thing which is known is um, a result of um, Kühle, Kühlman, and Mirek, Marek, sorry. So about seven years, no, already probably eight years ago, is yes for two colors. So it's actually an interesting story because uh, what they did is that they produced the, uh, so this paper, there is a, about this result, like uh, there is a paper in somewhat unusual journal for mathematicians called Nature. So uh, why there is a paper in Nature about that? Because the proof of this result for two colors takes about 200 terabytes. And uh, so this is, well, I don't know whether it still is, but at that time it was the longest mathematical proof. So what they did is that they colored integers from 1 to 7,000 and something and showed that no matter how you color already those 7,000 numbers, you get actually into colors, you get a solution to this equation. Okay? So, wonderful. So this is how the story is and I want to talk about this type of equation today. So about like um, some time after these conjectures have been stated and uh, uh, that this is partition regular, people realize that actually it makes sense. So this is called the Pythagorean triple conjecture, Pythagoras triples. And people understood that, uh, well, we actually, what about these versions of the furstenberg sarkozy theorem, so semaradi catholic So can we at least guarantee that the two sides of this triangle are of the same color? So can we find, no matter how we partition numbers into k colors, can we at least guarantee that these two sides say of the same color and maybe hypotenuse is of something different or vice versa. So this is called the Pythagorean pairs problem. Pythagorean pairs. So this is what I want to talk about today. And in general, what I want to talk about is what happens for the, so conjecture. I don't know whom to attribute it. We, we wrote it down, but the people knew about that. So I'm now interested in the given A, B, and C natural numbers. Uh, equation AX squared plus BY squared equals to CZ squared. Is partition regular with respect to X and Y? So namely, I want X and Y of the same color and set Z is other color. Uh, if AC, BC, or C times A plus B is a square. So in particular, if ABC equals to one, then all of, I mean, these two are squares, so we expect it to be, to be able to find two sides of the same color. And actually the same holds for uh, X and Z too. So I just stick for X, uh, for X and Y here, but I could uh, the same formulate this conjecture about X and Z. Is it a four or is it Sorry? Is it all three squares or just uh, No, you, you're right. Uh, if uh, one of, sorry, if one of them is a square, or at least one of them is a square, then this is partition right there. So theorem that I want to tell you about today, no, not me. Um, Naomi, with uh, Nikos Frazikinakis and Joel Moreira, is that if, we can't prove this, but if AC or BC is a square, then 
well, let me call it star, then star is partition regular. <clears throat> so if one of them, I don't know how to deal with this guy, but if one of these is, uh, is a square, then uh, we can say that uh, you can find this type of triangle and actually also this type of triangle, such that two sides are of the same color. Uh, so why I can do that? So let me just state the corollary here. So as we see if A equals to B equals to C equals to 1, then we simply get our Pythagoras e equation. And so we know that uh, Pythagorean pairs pairs are partition regular. There is one more uh, example which people have looked at, and this is an example where um, C is, uh, B is 2, and A equals to C equals to 1. In this case, AC is a square, and this is equation x squared plus 2y squared equals to z squared. So we can always make this theorem applies. And so you can always color this guy and this guy of the same color. And maybe Z of something else. Um, OK. Uh, so it might look, there, there is another uh, example, but one that we cannot do yet. This is a, also a well-known conjecture of Ruja that if you color integers in K colors, you can always find arithmetic progression of length three, which consists of squares, such that all three of them, or all two, or two, any two of them are colored of the same color. It's conjectured that even all three can be made one color. So this type of equation, we cannot do for now. And we can do it assuming some conjecture, which I will talk about after that. But this is like would be, you can see that this theorem is quite sensitive about like what, um, about the um, coefficients. Uh, this, this looks like a maybe a somewhat a strong assumption, but let me just give you a proposition. And if you are bored, you can try to, to prove it. But um, Maybe it takes a bit more time. But uh, actually, how close this is to the optimal conjecture? How close it is to the if and only if statement? So what one can prove is that if star is partition regular and none of them, AC, BC, and A plus B times C are not square, then we necessarily have that A, B, C, A plus B is. So one of these four should be a square for sure. So we are not that far from actually if and only if statement. OK? Wonderful. So. Uh, if this is clear, so what I want to spend, I'm not sure when I started, but what I want to uh, spend the rest of the time is actually describing the, this reasonably new approach to this type of questions and what exactly these theorems are about. So I'd like to move actually to the proof, unless there are questions. Yeah, in Z also, for instance, if you apply uh, AC, you, uh, this also applies for negative ones, actually. Uh, I just stated it in this way. So you can also say that this is for A equals to B equals to C equals to 1. You can also do X and, C, uh, X and Z okay, just by switch. Like yeah, yeah.
Yeah, we just can do two, but you can switch like which, whichever sides you want to cover. Okay, so let's try to describe like how one can approach such problems. So the story here is that since uh, Fustenberg, um, one of the very fruitful approaches in, in combinatorics in, in Ramsey, arithmetic Ramsey theory was a uh, Fustenberg correspondence principle. So let me call it roadmap to the proof. So uh, I would like to, the general first idea is that you would want to try to transfer this problem into ergodic theoretic language. Um, and uh, here the Fustenberg correspondence principle is a very universal thing and tells me the following. So let me just loosely state everything. So if I give you a set of natural numbers and I really want to understand how this uh, of positive density in whichever is so density positive where in any sense of density you want. So for example, let me take a density which is simply I intersect my set with a large interval. Look of what proportion of interval I occupy. And if I occupy enough, let's say lamb soup. If I o occupy enough of this proportion, I call it positive density set. So if I give you a positive density set, and I want to understand how this positive density set self-intersect itself when I start shifting it. So I start shifting it. And I would really want to understand how it reaches this intersection. So Fustenberg s told us that actually, if I want to understand how rich this intersection is, I can always find a measurable space, x. I can always find the Borel sigma algebra. I can always find the bounded measure on it. I can always find a measure preserving transformation, say invertible. Uh, so and I can always find a set A, which is a measure theoretic model of E. So it's a measure preserving transformation. So it preserves the measure. And uh, the density of my set E is the same as the measure of my A. And if I want to understand this intersection, how when I shift my set E, this is the same as to understand, or rather, so for any shifts that I take, this richness can be bounded from below by the measure of the return in times of my transformation T after these times of shifts. Well, it's not. So Sam already used it to prove his famous, uh, give an ergodic theoretic proof of his, um, of the sam theorem for arithmetic progression. So in particular, if you take here D, 2D, 3D, and KD, what he proved is that after these frequencies, no matter which set you take and which er uh, transformation you take, you get this positive. And that's how he deduced that the set of positive density has infinite uh, or arbitrary long arithmetic progressions because this intersection is rich. Wonderful. So uh, why don't we try to apply this to our equation? So let me stick with Pythagoras' equation. So of course, if we are working with Pythagoras' equation, it would be nice to remember the parameterization. 
So this is parameterization of my equation. And uh, so I might expect that maybe one of these colors, usually how these proofs go, is that I color integers into k colors. I have a color which has a positive density. So let me try to prove that I'm not just partition regular, but what is called density regular. That in any set of positive density, I can find solution to the equation x squared plus y squared equals to z squared. So I would like to do that, but I quickly understand that if I take x and y to be 1 mod 3, and I add them up together, well, there is no way I will get like 2 mod 3 being a square. So I give you a set of positive density of 1 third, which does not have solution to this equation x squared plus y squared. So applying this principle to this directly is uh, somewhat hard and probably not possible. So what is the reason for that, that I cannot apply this guy to, to my equation? Well, the reason here is that this, this applies for additively rich equations. But this equation, it doesn't really remember additive structure that much because there are these squares. What it does remember, though, is the multiplicative structure because I can multiply everything by the same number and still get a solution. So this type of equation is not additively rich, but multiplicatively rich. And therefore, perhaps measuring density with respect to additive set is not the right notion. And I need to come up with a notion of multiplicative density, measure the density with respect to something multiplicative. So here is a definition. So what, how do we measure density with respect to something multiplicative? So I will define for, for people in ergodic theory, this is very well known. But uh, let me define fk uh, to be a Fulner sequence so if no matter which number I take, natural, and I look how my set intersect with the multiplicative translate of it. Well, and I look what portion of this, of my set I occupy. Well, when I take limb, let's say limb soup. Oh, let, let me even do with limit. When I take limb, uh, limit when k goes to infinity, I want it to be one. So what does it mean? Starting from some point, this is a sequence of natural numbers. Starting from some point, all members of my phi k, essentially almost all members, are divisible by any number I give. So uh, this is maybe a bit, uh, let me give you an example. So here is phi k, which is important. So, every phi k is the subset of n, right? Yes, every phi k is the subset of n. I will give it an example, and it will be very clear what it is. So how I can build my subset of n? I can take, very, take first k primes and raise them to very high powers, let's say smaller than 2k. So I can keep, uh, you can see that these sets phi k are kind of multiplicatively getting richer and richer and richer because they immerse everything what is in before. So no matter which number I take, I start being divisible by that. Make sense? So this is the good example to take in mind. Multiplicatively expanding sets. <clears throat> okay, so now I can define the density I can define the density of any set. So for given any set E in N, I can define density with respect to Fulner sequence as we defined them before. So I take limb soup if K goes to infinity, and I look how my set intersect my Fulner sequence, and I see what portion of the Fulner sequence I have. And if this is positive, I call that E has positive de density with respect to F, phi, with respect to Fulner sequence. So what I want to show right now, my goal, 
is actually this is the right uh, this seems to be like a right uh, notion of density so what I want to show so here is the goal no matter if I give you for every set let's say for every set E which is subset of integers such that the density of with respect to some Follner sequence is positive that exist E, X, and Y, let's say, in this set E, such that X squared plus Y squared equals to N squared. So we this equation, what we are aiming for, is to show that it's density regular, but with respect to this new notion of density, which remembers multiplicativity. So this is what I want to show. OK. Um, now, how would I want to show that? So uh, let's try to apply. Now we are in position that maybe we can apply Fustenberg correspondence principle and try to actually reformulate this into ergodic theoretic language because we have this notion of density. Um, so what does it mean here? Let me just uh, gloss over the details, but uh, now how does the Fustenberg correspondence um, principle will look like on this side? So what I want to prove So now what I have is that I have a measure preserving I, I have a measure space. Again, I have a measure I have a Borel set. Nothing is changing now. I'm starting with the any set E of positive density. So I do have a set A, which is the, again the model of my um, set E. But now what I have is that I have a measure, family of measure preserving transformations. So this is measure preserving. So the measure of Tn. I will explain right now what I'm writing. So I have a measure preserving for every B in this Borel sets, sigma algebra. But what is this family? So N here is parametrized by natural numbers. So what is the difference? What do we ask, what do we know about Tn? Well, here what I had is that I had a group of natural, group of Z or group of natural numbers, semi-group acting in a measure-preserving way on the, uh, acting in a measure-preserving way. So I have this sequences of transformations which satisfy the usual rule. T of M plus N is T of M times T, T of M commutate. Like just a composition law. Uh, now what I have here is I uh, explained here that we are actually acting using the multiplicative structure. So actually, it's not the group N which acts, but uh, really, it's, a, it's the underlying group or semi-group. This is, uh, let me, instead of N, extend this to the rational numbers, non-negative rational numbers with multiplication. But you can think of this as an action of M. So what does it satisfy? This satisfies the condition that if I act on integers, on the product of integers, so T of M N is T of M, T of M. So it acts in the multiplicative way. So it's a multiplicative action of Q on, uh, in the measure-preserving way. Um, 
So let me uh, perhaps th that I don't lose you. I keep in mind, so here is one uh, example of this since we already were talking a lot about this before. So I can take a disk. What would be an example of this? So I can take a disk and act on disk by rotation where f is completely, you already saw a lot of these examples, it's a completely multiplicative function. f of m, f of n, is f of m times f of n. So if you think about that, this is just a rotation by f of n, and t of m n will be like f of m n z, and this is f of m z times f of n z. So this is just a rota multiplicative rotation of the circle. So let me give you another example, because it might be confusing, and it should be, actually, if you haven't dealt with these things before. So here is another example. If you saw the additive action, here is one more example. So for t, I can take a normal, for t um, of n, so tn, this is tn, for tn, I can take an action which is, take your favorite additive action, rotations uh, or whatever it is, take the normal action that you are used to and raise it instead to the power of number of prime factors of n. Then when you apply T of mn, you will get T of dub, uh, omega mn and that's going to be split in, into the sum. So from any additive action, you can go to this multiplicative action just by putting a number of divisors here. So there are many examples of these types. So then you mean like the subject Yeah, I, I write it sometimes. Let me just like write it. And I can easily extend it to the action of rational. I can say that this is T of M, T of minus N. My t of minus 1. I can easily extend it to the action of action. Okay, so if it's too ergodic, then um, what am I interested in? So I am interested, if I want to apply Fustenberg correspondence principle, then I'm interested, I want to show, let me write here, want to show like in the Fustenberg scene, that there exist M and N such that uh, if I look at the returning times after, by the way, I should have written here that mu of A is again equal to the density. But what I want to understand is that whether I return to my set after the times that parameterize the Pythagoras equation. So m squared, let's say, minus n squared a, and let's say 2m. Let me do the harder case. Uh, maybe I want to prove instead of x and y, I want to prove x and z. Or, okay. So this is x and y, but I can ask exactly the same question if here was m squared plus n squared. So, and if I can show that this is uh, rich for infinitely many m and n, then I proved my theorem using the Fustenberg correspondence principle. Okay? Um, okay. So, Therefore, what I want to understand is that I really want to make, an, if I want to somehow get my hands on these uh, expressions, what I really want to understand is what does it mean, do I have a good interpretation for these types of intersection? So I take a measure of preserving transformation which is in multiplicative way acts, do I have a good transformation of that? Do, do I have a good uh, formula for this? And uh, the, well, if you are used to the additive transformations, 
And then you actually might remember that this is actually a Fourier coefficient on the measure which, which is defined on the dual group. So what does, it, what does it mean? It means that this thing is actually correspond to the measure on the dual group. I will explain what it is right now. And so this is a Fourier coefficient. So this is an integral of the, over the dual group, which I call M, of, of the uh, character on the dual group. So let's just understand, it, it's kind of a subtle point, and then I will move to number theory, I promise. Uh, so in the, in the last whatever time I have. But um, so this is a measure on, uh, on the dual group. And what is the dual group for my action? So I have an action of Q. So the dual group, these are characters, these are homomorphisms that preserve multiplication of rationals. So it's homomorphisms from rationals, but let's say for natural numbers, we will extend it to the unit sphere such that they preserve the multiplication of natural numbers. And in particular, they preserve multiplication of rational numbers because I can just write it in a trivial way. So once again, I am acting by Q with multiplication as a group. So what is the dual group for Q? These are characters that preserve multiplication. And these functions you have seen already in this conference many times. It's a completely multiplicative functions. So perhaps this is an integral over this group of multiplicative function where, well, this is a Fourier coefficient. I can write it as m. Um, well, actually, I didn't even need this, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Tmn, so f of m, f of m conjugate. I guess what is easier for me to write, let, let me just write it in this way. So mn, and I intersect with a, because I measure preserving, I can flip. This is just the integral of f over f of mn. And what is sigma f? So sigma f is Borel measure, Borel measure on uh, this group of m. So multiplicative functions, those are just, uh, you can think of them as uh, being parameterized on f of p because it's enough to give the values on f of p and this is just a long string of numbers. So you can take, you can consider the pointwise convergence topology there and define everything. So I will not spend time on that. But so sigma f is some measure that lives on these strings of multiplicative function. This is the Fourier coefficient of that. And so what I want to prove really So now I'm getting to the problem that I will need to deal with the more analytic objects which are these multiplicative functions. And what I want to prove is the following statement. So I have a nice interpretation of my return in times. So here is a goal. When I say goal, it means we proved it, like this is the way that we prove. So here is the goal. What I, I would be in a good shape if I managed to show that when I take an average, over all m and I, we, we can't really find this m and n, one m and n. So I better try to average over many m and n's and show that some average is non-negative or positive. Then I can find Sorry, this one. Yeah. So you can think of the f of p's uh, as a just strings. Yeah. 
of that. So there is some measure in the point-wise topology. There is some uh, there there is some measure which lives on this uh, on this space of the strings parameterized by f of p's. <laughs> yes, it's an infinite dimensional space. It's just strings that parameterized by f of p, and there is some measure which lives there. We have no idea what this measure is, except that we know. I actually I, I, I was going to uh, state it right now exactly what we know about this measure. So we, we, we know nothing. It can be atomic, can be supported on three functions, for instance. Or can be continuous in some way, can be supported on the balls uh, around this f of p. We know nothing about that. And this is the whole difficulty of trying to prove something for all measures. Because Fustenberg correspondence principle, it's a compactness argument. So it doesn't really give you what the underlying measure is. Uh, so, but I do know something about this measure. I know that if I take a function one, this is multiplicative function one, 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 one. So what I know is that because uh, it charges, if f is one, uh, it charges mass to this function. It's a, if you have m equals to n, this is a positive, it, it just one, it, it's a positive integral. So if m equals to n, you get a function one, so you know that this is non-negative, just from density consideration. So you know that function one is an atom in some sense of this measure, OK? And you know some, one, one more property. But in general, it's just a measure. So what I want to show is that maybe I can find a lot of m and n. Maybe I can average over my m and n over large uh, lattice. And I will put here star, because actually the main point here is to find a good sub lattice of n by n. So what I want to show that if I have this averages over my group of this return in times, so I can just like look at my m squared, n squared, and say 2mn df. So if I have this, or maybe here m squared plus n squared, if I manage to show that lim inf of this when n goes to infinity is positive, then I would know that some of them give positive contribution. And that means that I returned to my set and I proved what I wanted. So this is what we showed. So for every measure, uh, Borel, on uh, M such that it charges positive mass to one. There is another condition because it comes from this measure uh, from, the den from the previous measure on the group. There is also a condition of non-negativity. But for any measure you take, we can show that this average over some nice subset of this is large, and then things are good. OK? So this is the goal. OK. Uh, so now I reformulated the problem after all this time. I reformulated the problem into some statement about well, I can flip the integral and expectation. So I have integral, and here I have average. So now, I, in order to understand this problem, I just need to understand, actually, how do these correlation of multiplicative functions behave and try to prove this non-negativity. And if we have an integral over the group, really, so I have a problems in analytic number theory. I have an integral over the group. Uh, how do I understand that? Well, I understand it usually using the circle method, and we've seen already uh, the talks here about that. So if I have really a, some additive problem, I usually write this as a circle method, and I try to understand what is the major arc, minor arc, and try to find the main contribution and say that everything is good. So what I want to do is to look at this. I have an integral over the group of something. So what I want to look at it as a circle method problem, actually over the group M. And uh, when we have a circle method, 
So we always, in the number theory, so let me call it, we call it what is called now a pretentious circle method. And I will explain in a minute like what it means. Um, so pretentious circle method is I want to understand what, what is the main contribution. So when does it go to zero, this bit, and when it doesn't? When does it give a good contribution? So if I look at this guy, so let me just forget about this guy, forget about like everything. So let me just ask a very simple question. I have a function f, say from uh, natural numbers to S1, which is completely multiplicative. F is multiplicative. So if I want to understand what gives me the main contribution, I better answer the question when this average goes to zero and when it doesn't. So it doesn't go really to zero whenever I have or, or it doesn't. And as this question is very classical in multiplicative number theory because Halash in the 60s, at the end of 60, he completely explained this situation. For what functions f does it go to zero or it doesn't? So what Halash proved is that this average is always zero. So for every f multiplicative, this average, let me call it double star, goes to zero, pretty much for every function, unless it's not, it doesn't. So when, for which multiplicative functions, or completely multiplicative functions, for which it doesn't go to zero? So of course, if I take a function one, it doesn't really go to zero. I can also take a function 1, 1, 1 on all the primes except one prime and switch it to something else. And it's also going to have a large mean value. So if the function is close to 1, then it's hard to make this mean value 0. But, and this is what Halash proved, that unless f is close in some sense, to the function, but it's not just one, but there is another weird function, which is p to the it. So unless in this very weirdly looking expression, unless this sum is uh, bounded, we can always have a mean value going to zero. So function n to the it is a very dear function in this type of businesses because this is the function which rotates very, very, very slowly around the circle. And so these mean values do not go to zero. They accumulate. But functions that do not look like n to the it, so they are f of p is not p to the it often, means that this sum is usually unbounded. And so for such functions, Everything is fine. I'm ignoring here a lot of details. Um, what time did I start, actually? You have like um, seven minutes, six minutes. Seven, six minutes. Ooh, generous. OK. No, uh, then I can continue. Mm. So we identified a type of functions which are close to p to the it, such that these averages do not go to 0. So uh, in general, why we call it pretentious circle method. So Granville and Sound, Sundarajan, define the distance function, which is the right way to measure the distance between two multiplicative functions. And it turns out that the right way to measure the distance between two multiplicative functions actually the square of the distance, is this weirdly looking expression that I, you've already seen. So this is what is called pretentious approach to analytic number theory. So 
So that defines this weird distance. Sorry? Uh, I, it's, distance is not supposed to be bounded. It's just a distance. Fn, uh, yeah, I always work on S1. So f and g are bounded by one. Yes. I always work in this. Other functions for me do not exist. So Thank you. What does it mean by smaller than infinity in this sense? Just that it's bounded or that it's squared? It's just bounded because it's an infinite sum of the positive terms. And just this, if the series converges, then. Positive. So p from minus i p is not real, right? But it's real part. So, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, should, uh, I should keep track of my brackets. Makes sense. OK, so we say that f pretends to be p to the it, or f pretends to be n to the it, if this distance is bounded. It means f pretends to be n to the it. It's very close to n to the it. So our Halas theorem tells you that, well, if I ignore this complicated expression, that all the averages go to zero unless f is pretentious or in the sense of f pretends to be n to the it. Okay, so we kind of now understood what is one obstacle might be for this to go to zero. Something which is on the major arc might be these functions that are close to p to the it because they give you some contribution. But then the natural question is to ask, okay, but what about well, let's say I have now, I don't have here one single average, but I have a correlation. So it's, it makes sense to understand when I get this average just, when does this go to zero? I just written n and n plus three doesn't matter, f of n, n plus five, and here there's two variables, so it's a different story, but just to get the feeling. So when does this thing, when is this thing negligible? So let's just think what are our, so here this is a theorem. And what I'm going to state now, this is a philosophy or wishful thinking. But what we believe, wishful thinking. So what, what we believe, so when do these things don't go to zero? Well, of course, if f again is close to n to the it, then this is n to the it. This rotates very slowly. This is like n to the it. n plus 3 to the it is the same as n to the it. So that points to 1 very, very often. So it doesn't go to 0. Again, obstruction. But for correlation, there is one more obstruction. Because if I'm a character, if I'm periodic mod 3, if I'm a character mod 3, then I also correlate f of n and f of n plus 3. So what I want to put here, that perhaps Dirichlet characters, which we've seen in the talks in this thing, uh, that uh, they are also obstruction for these guys. So what we believe is that unless, and this is very far from being proved in the gener this generality, that these correlations do go to zero unless you are close in this metric to, this, uh, to these gadgets. And I just like conclude here, so since Philippe was gener generous about the time, uh, well, I started late, but uh, so what we essentially did is that we partitioned M, why it's called circle method, in those functions which are pretentious and those functions that ergodic theorists called aperiodic, so non-pretentious. And uh, what one proves is that for these functions, you do go to zero. This is what is called minor arc in the normal circle method and major arc there is the analytic arguments how to handle that. And that's, that's it. I'll stop here. Thank you.